for the recording sake, do you just want to like give everyone a spiel of like who you are, what you do? You're a pretty cool lad. Tie some pretty cool flies. <laughs> Thanks. Very, very innovative in your tying and uh, you catch fish, most importantly. So um, uh, when I get into fish, you know, some, sometimes I find success. I think I've been skunked as much as everybody else you know so no expert but i wanted to start out by saying um patrick had told me that there's uh either you're all veterans or uh, most are canadian uh veterans so thank you so much for your service i mean i know i'm um american but you know both my grandparents were in the military my brother was in the marines and uh i i appreciate it a ton and don't take it for so thank you so very much for the sacrifice and everything you guys have done. So I'm really honored to be able to uh, tie with a group of guys like yourself. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, so, okay, I'm Alex. I'm from St. Ignis, Michigan, which is where I live now with my wife. Uh, four kids. My main occupation is actually we run a, a full garden center and floral shops so my wife does the floral and she actually makes more uh money than i do so they do weddings in the summer on Ma because we live right by mackinac island and uh I, I can go on for a while so just tell me when you've had enough i'm sorry um <laughs> mackinac island we grew up there it's kind of like this old victorian uh style island basically is popular because there's a history of like the french and english and controlling the straits and that channel and it's it's the tallest island or it has the most height out of all the ones around it so it's actually strategic for trading which is why it's kind of a tourist destination now neat area uh no cars allowed they do have an ambulance and fire department but still all horse and buggy very Victorian, I guess, in its uh, look, but modern in the sense there's restaurants, bars, and hotels over there. So because of that, um, you know, our floral end does really good. There's weddings that go on there all the time. I do greenhouse garden center, like growing, uh, hanging basket, shrubs, perennials, retail settings, stuff like that. So we've pretty much lived here all of our lives. We traveled, um, a little bit. I left college early, had no idea what I wanted to do going in, had no idea what I wanted to do while I was there. Didn't like the idea of going into debt. And so I worked on the Great Lakes as a merchant mariner and traveled around with that license and eventually we came back and bought the greenhouse. Um, moved back here in 2014 and found an old fly rod I must have bought as a kid from the local hardware store in my dad's uh, garage and uh, figured, you know, this kind of something I've always wanted to get into. So I uh, got into it around 2014, 15. And right at that time, looking at magazines on the internet, I saw uh, the spay rod, the two-handed rod, and that just really, really intrigued me. I think maybe just from, uh, you know, a shallow view. I'm like, wow, that looks cool. That, that just looks like fun to do. So kind of got into that and um, found that to be one of the most fun ways to fish. I still like single hand fishing and stuff, but uh, got a vice for fly tying on my birthday in 2018. So not that long ago. And I mean, if you guys are, I don't know how long everybody's been tying for but that almost becomes like a joy in and of itself you know I mean I, I find sometimes that if <laughs> I got a limited amount of time with kids and business so it's like if I have a couple hours do I really want to gear up and go to the river or would I like to sit and tie some flies I know that, that sounds kind of like blasphemy but sometimes I'm like ah, I'd rather sit and um, tie flies so I, I just think it's a lot of fun and uh, just a, a great outlet. It's fun to make pretty stuff, you know. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, you don't need to tie perfect flies or great looking flies to catch fish. I, I think it's just fun. It just adds to the whole uh, experience of, you know, gearing up, put, putting on a nice reel, click and pull, whatever you like, uh, 
really high end, nice rod and putting on nice flies that you tied that are pretty. It's just, uh, it's, I, I think it's a really fun uh, hobby and our passion really, it's more than a hobby, but fly tying just kind of is like the icing on the cake on the whole thing. I don't know, I, I think it's fun to tie a fly and catch a fish on, on, on your own fly. You know, I've, I've never experienced anything uh, that really tops that in, in fishing or outdoors. You know, in fact, I, I sold most of my hunting rifles because I, I just uh, just didn't want to sit in a blind waiting for deer anymore. I was thinking about fly tying and, you know, going out and if the steelhead were in the rivers. So that's just kind of what happened to me, got bit by the bug and stuff like that. So it's uh, pretty much just like, you know, really doing it and got to do several write-ups now for like Daniki Outdoors, which is cool. They reached out to me. Um, A-Rex, actually Hook Company, have to give them a shout out, made me a pro team member, uh, which really just basically means I get tons of their hooks really cheap. So it just keeps that addiction going and stuff like that. But really good Hook Company, if you never use them, they make pretty much every kind of, all they do is fly fishing hooks and they make every kind you could think of from scandy doubles to intruder hooks or pike hooks so on and so forth so good company but yeah that's pretty much where i'm at with um fly tying how i got into it and everything else so sorry about a long-winded uh spiel so we'll jump into um first fly and we're gonna i'm just doing it on a hook this is uh like a trout two hook you could do it on gamagatsu bt or D10S hooks as well, uh, just depending on the species that you want to go for, steelhead or, or trout. I find our, my steelhead in my local river that these kind of trout size four or twos are actually real good. Um, quick history about the munker, though, is... Bye -bye. Good night, buddy. Love you. Uh, munker is just... This is one I pulled out of my box. It gets smashed. This looks more like the original kind of munker. Uh, Kim Sorensen in Denmark tied it. And Munker is just kind of like this combination of Zonker, Muddler head. And so his was with these American possum wings. You can see the, the Muddler or his Munker style head. And I like this head a lot. It's really like narrow in this way. So it's tied in a very short area, but very wide at the, um, the same time. And you put a little weight on the tube and he put these shrimp eyes on and everything else. But um, what that does is it actually pushes a lot of water underneath the surface, almost makes a disturbance. Uh, when it's really wide and narrow like that, it requires a lot less deer hair, I guess, than a traditional muddler would. So, uh, you know, you're able to get it to sink, you can cast it fine. But if you take these, lift them out of the water, put them back in, in on your feet, you'll kind of see air bubbles start coming out of it. And so when it's swinging through and, and whether it's colored water or whatnot, for whatever reason, it has a really good effect on fish and that it's not just swimming through, it's kind of like pushing through the river system. Anyway, we've had really good success on these. I've kind of changed it a little bit for our river. And even though this looks uh, kind of ugly, turned it into more of a, a sculpin style. You can see kind of like the pectoral fins I put on. Really simple to do, kind of natural copper flash. This is on actually a, like a tungsten weighted tube as well. So you can really drop it into steelhead runs. And like I said, the heads got smashed in the box. They don't have to be perfect, but I've, I've had great success in the Great Lakes with these kind of natural like uh, sculper, sculp and munker styles. And for whatever reason, they seem to grab the attention from fish really good, whether they can hear it, see it or whatnot. And just seems to make more of a disturbance than just putting marabou or something underneath, um, on the front of it. And yeah, that was kind of the idea we've, uh, you know, pretty much tested fishing these in a lot of different river systems and, it's worked admirably well on Atlantic salmon, steelhead, um, for the most part, like swinging in the runs and everything. And <clears throat> so I'll show you how I do it. And I decided to do it on a hook. Um, 
the tube is, it's not hard. It's a little bit more involved, but uh, like I said, my first steel had last year came on a fly very much like that on uh, a hook. So, and these are easy to tie on. So this is going to be real simple without really much body to it at all. So I put like a brass bead or tungsten bead on my hook and you kind of want to set back a, a, at least halfway. And I'll say this, since we're gonna sp spin deer onto it, one trick with uh, spinning deer hair that I found, I don't know how much you guys have spent uh, spinning deer hair, but it can, it can kind of like get under your skin after a while if you've never done it or just started doing it, like trying to figure out why won't it spin? How do you make it look good? One tip is- Wait, sorry, um, Alex. I just wanted to um, uh, like yeah. for, for the beginners in the group, like, I don't think we've, we haven't tied the muddler yet, so they won't be familiar with tying deer or spinning deer hair. So I really yes. like what you're doing here. But um, if you want to like, like do like a really bare bones explanation, just to like give them a, a good idea of what it's like from sure. coming okay. from no knowledge of spinning deer hair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, when we get to the deer head, I'll walk you through how I make this kind of wide monker head in a really tight area. Uh, my suggestion is, you know, if you want to tie different muddlers is, get on YouTube, Davey McPhail. There's all different ways to do a muddler deer head. And just for the sake of this, I'll show you um, my favorite way to get just what I call that monker type head. And really the idea of the deer hair when we get there is we're almost trying to make like a turbo cone with that deer hair in itself. And you, you know, a turbo cone is really wide but really skinny, so it pushes a lot of water. So I'll show you how I do that one. Now, for spinning deer hair, it's a lot easier if you spin on a bare shank. And if you're doing it on a tube, uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but you wanna make sure you're spinning on a bare tube, meaning don't start your thread right up behind the eye. It'll be a lot harder to get that deer hair to spin around. So I'll actually start my thread somewhere right around here, almost right where I'm gonna have that um, bead at. And I'll show you how I lock in this bead. So I'll just get some thread onto the shank, you know, three quarters, halfway back roughly. Give yourself a little bit more space if you're new to tying, else you'll run out of space real quick. As you go on, you'll find you just naturally get cleaner and, and, and tighter. It's just more of a repetition thing. So I'll get some, thread right on it like that super glue not all super glues made the same uh the crazy glue on a brush with this orange top and you can get it on amazon really cheap is the best super glue i've ever used i've messed around with loctite gorilla glue and afterwards you can still kind of go and get that undone when this stuff finally dries up and it dries clear which is cool you can almost use it as a head cement as well it is almost impossible possible to break this stuff up and I like it on a brush too uh, you'll see as we go because you can just brush your thread with glue and tie into certain materials without making a big mess as well so the crazy glue orange top with a brush I highly recommend it. I think it's like two bucks or three bucks a piece on Amazon I just order them six at a time so I'm just going to brush a little bit of the glue Make sure you always close the top too, because you'll knock this thing uh, over and destroy a bunch of stuff. And I just kind of get that, that bead up there and I'll just kind of crisscross my thread around that bead then. And I don't really mind that the threads, you can see the thread on the bead. I'll just kind of exit a few times, sits on the glue, not going anywhere. So for, for those, of, we just tied the clouser last week. Yep. This, um, the method that Alex is using to lock the bead in the middle of the hook shank is exactly mm -hmm. the same technique we did to lock in the dumbbell yeah. eyes. Yeah. yeah. And I just figure, I mean, there's glue on there. It's going to stay. I mean, you exit several times. I've, I mean, I've never had one come undone. I suppose it's possible if something cut it all on there, but that's that's pretty solid for what it is. So like I said, this one is going to be a real simple fly uh, for the reason that it, it works really well. So I'm not using a lot of hackles or anything here. We're basically going to do the bead. We're going to go into a zonker 
and we'll add just a little bit of flash and we'll tie the deer head on. And I, I know that sounds overly simplified, but it's really effective. So I'm gonna to try to explain this real quick. And this is important. So when you think of a zonker, um, what really helped me in tying nicer zonker flies that don't wind up the hook, that really move the best, is it's the same principle as any hair wing. And you'll see when we get to the temple dog, what I mean, you want a fatter front out to a skinny uh, back. And I'll show you exactly how I taper it. And the reason that I'm gonna taper it that way too, is if you were to just tie this zonker, just on a hook without anything, just tied it and you put it in a fish tank and you left that zonker strip totally square, you'll notice in the water, it wants to continually roll like this. It wants to move just the nature of the zonker and physics in the water, I guess that's above my pay grade, but it always kind of wants to roll around. If we take it and we trim it out like a V, so we're square in this end and we go to a V out to this end and you tied that same zonker on a hook and put it in the swim tank, it'll just ride true. That zonker will not roll anymore. And what you get is it actually moves more, but it's not rolling the hook. It's not winding into the hook. Uh, really simple trick. I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube on that and they get pretty complicated in how they do it. They'll take scalpels and razors. My favorite way, really hard to show on here is I just use a pair of scissors. And what I do is I'll start, uh, let me do it and then I'll show you what it looks like. But watch how I do this is I'll just kind of fold all the hair down. You can wet your finger. And on one side, I'll just come and I'll slowly with a sharp pair of scissors, you'll see the end here hard to show and I just kind of cut it and I'm tapering it down to the middle and I'll come on the other side too. If you fold the hair in your hand like this against where you're going to cut, you'll never cut through it and cut off hair you don't want. And this is just so much faster, so much easier than trying to pin these down on your bench and use a scalpel. So you're really actually fun. cutting you're actually cutting the, the leather in the back side of the hair then. I am, and I'm just folding that over so I don't cut any unwanted hair. And what I'm trying to go for is something like that. See how it goes to a V? Yeah. And then it's fat on this end. And actually, because the nature of that taper already starts to give the wing a lift. And it's skinnier out here and it's fatter up here. And that's going to help it to actually wave and not roll. It just rides true. So it really simple thing to do. You get more movement and you remove some rabbit material too, which is, you know, any amount of material you remove is going to make it easy to cast. So take, take your time on that. You'll have to practice that on your own. I mean, I've tried it a million different ways, but the best way I found, and it doesn't have to look perfect. If you have a really skinny strip, let's say you're doing pine squirrel, I would just come on one side. I wouldn't do both sides. You know, if you have a little bit of a wider strip, then you can come from both sides. But it's just about getting a fat front to a skinny back. Whatever side I'm going to trim it on, like I said, I just fold that hair down and then kind of just take my time. And you'll never cross through and have a bare spot. Does that make sense, I guess, what I'm... Yeah. How... Uh... How wide do you want your thick spot? I'll leave it. Uh, so I'll start maybe like three quarters down. So I'll leave that thick spot. However, it, it depends on how big you want it. Let's say you got a quarter inch zonker strip or whatever size zonker strip I'm using, I'll leave the head. You know, I want just an eighth of an inch or whatever it is to stay fat in the front. So I won't start right at the front, like I'll, you can see I started right about, you know, I got things coming. I started right about there. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I kind of left that, that front and I'll show you why I want to do that as well. Once you get that trim, like I said, we can take as much time. This is, it's gonna be a fun trick here. You guys are gonna like this, but I take this and I'll cut I mean, just a few millimeters of a slit right in the front. And I'll show you exactly why 
I do that just at the top, dead center, a little slit. And I'll show you why I like to <clears throat> do that. So let me know when everybody's. Okay, how stuff. long is your soccer strip piece? Oh, uh, maybe three inches total. I don't like zonkers way too yeah. long. I just, I, I don't know what it is that maybe there's a time and place for that, but I, I kind of tend to stick right in this same, especially for Great Lakes steelhead and salmon. I don't really think you need to get much longer. You could go a little bit more. You're or about, you two, could, you're about yeah. two and a half the hook length then, roughly. I'm exactly double the entire hook length, but from my tie-in point, about two and a half, yeah. Okay. Yep. That's good. I got to remember that if I ever do this again, though. Well, it's just hard to reference size when you're it is. on a screen. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, after a while, too, if you're, um, I used to have little measurements. I think I still got them marked all over my fly tying desk here where I would like mark things so I could just always like measure it the same and, and I think after a while you just kind of get into a, a natural flow you just kind of look at something and trim it and you're almost like dead on after a while so sometimes I'll make I used to make like these little marks so I could cut all my zonkers the the same or whatever and that that can be useful too so I would say it, it for, you know, and this isn't just for first time tires. I think um, one discipline to, to always get accustomed to and to always be trying uh, is kind of the less is more theory. And I don't mean to be cliche about that, but I, I think it's a lot better. You're, you're a lot farther along if you discipline yourself. And at the end of it, you're like, you know, I could have added a little bit more material or, you know, maybe I could have went a little longer on the zonker strip. That's a lot better place to be than constantly overdressing a fly. It's a lot harder to learn how to um, use less than it is to use more. I think my, my opinion, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that little slit in the front, uh, is, is for a reason. And I'll show you here at the end. Well, I'll show you now. So what I do when I tie my zonkers in, and I do this all the time now, and I got this idea from Temple Dogs, is I'll actually tie the zonker in reverse. I know that, and I'll kind of show you, and I'll push that slit kind of up into the, the bead a little bit and almost just kind of spread it, you know? So my tie-in point, I'll show you here. I'll do a couple wraps. You can see my tie-in point is, see how that slit kind of pushes up and I'm tying just a little bit past it like that. That's where I like to be. And that slit, when you cut it, actually kind of allows you to almost push it down and kind of envelop the top half of the hook as it were. This is why I like the crazy glue with a brush. Now you, you probably don't need glue here. I always think of it as the cheap insurance policy. Uh, and so instead of making a big mess, I can just brush a little bit on my thread. And I like that. It comes out really clean that way. You don't get a big glob of glue. And I'll wrap it a few times and then just kind of tighten it up and there I am. So that the glue with the brush, I'm telling you, that is, it is so nice to be able to just brush a little bit on your thread as you go versus trying to take that. Imagine there's, I don't care how neat you are. If you take a dropper or a brush and you're trying to brush it, you're inevitably going to get it all over material and stuff's going to get stuck. If you can just brush it onto your thread, you can actually loop it in and cinch it and it all kind of like locks in really nice. So. If anybody has any questions, let me know. And this, this works for any zonker. We're using rabbit here. I like rabbit, but you can, I mean, whether it's pine squirrel, American possum, I mean, you can pretty much zonk anything, I, I guess, as long as the hide is 
is thin enough. Rabbit's just, it's cheap. It works as good as anything else available in a lot of colors. Available just about anywhere. It, it is, you know, and it moves exceptionally well. I've experimented with, I got all kinds of zonker material. If you really want, in my opinion, on what moves best in the water, I'd say it'd be really hard to beat a, ra a rabbit zonker strip. I mean, truth be told, it's about as good as it comes. So what I do here, when I'm ready to, to tie in is, is what I'll do. And now you got it locked in really good. I'll pull it. Now you can actually pull, cause we cut that slit. You can actually bend some of that rabbit hair around. So it in and of itself becomes like a hackle. Now this is key. I don't tie back onto the rabbit like that. I just simply tie in front of it, like a thread dam, a few turns. And the nice thing about that is it gives, I don't know if you can see the wing. Yeah, good job. The wing already kind of starting to form that nice temple dog tear shape wing. And, and you can do this, you don't even need a bead. So if you're doing it on your own, let's say you just want to tie a piece of guinea hackle behind it, just by simply reverse tying, you don't need a huge prop. Like you see people doing with intruders having all this uh, rabbit or fox to try to lift that wing up. That wing already has a nice lift now to it, which gives you a lot more motion. That slit, if you can see in there, allows you to use that um, rabbit hair as a hackle too now. You can just kind of fold it around and, and there it is. And so you're, you're basically using the same amount of a rabbit that you would have used if you tied it in normal. <clears throat> but now you're kind of forcing it to to bite a little bit more in the current, gives it more movement, it's not gonna roll, and you can use that hair now um, as a hackle. And, and the other thing that I really like about doing it this way, and I've showed a few people this, I didn't invent it because I've gone back and looked at different forms and stuff and discovered Scandi guys were doing this. This was just really kind of piecing a few ideas that I had you know, found in different tying styles with how they tie uh, the original temple dog style combined with tapering things out. So, but uh, case in point, uh, the people that I've showed this, you know, it's funny, a lot of times uh, they'll come back and um, I've heard two people say, you're right, it moves way more in the water. And another friend of mine is like, I quit fishing with rabbit because it always tangled on the hook. He said, I've yet to have this one tangle on the hook so and, and really if you think about it it's really not that much more time tying it in that way as it is tying it in regular it's just a couple quick steps the other thing i like about this too let's say you just were tying on an intruder shank or a hook or whatever your very next material now gets to be right tight against a rabbit if you just want to finish that with slapping or marabou you're not trying to cover up a bunch of Hide or anything, you you get a real nice profile here. If you just tied a uh, piece of schlappen or any old hackle, you just have a really nice looking fly and profile right off the, um, you know, without. I mean, we have a bead and rabbit on here, and it's just about ready to fish. And I really like that because big bulky rabbit flies uh, suck to cast, especially with the spay rod. And you'll find this one really breathes in the water. So, yeah. any questions so far? We're doing good. What do you mean by breathes in the water? It, it just seems to because you don't have all kinds of material to create the the profile that you're trying to get. In other words, if you just tied it straight on, uh, now the bead is giving it some lift too. But let's say you didn't have a a bead, you didn't want it weighted. Uh, if you just tie the rabbit straight on, didn't do the slit, didn't use the hackle, all you have is really kind of just a straight piece of rabbit. Uh, in order to kind of get a profile like this, then you'd have to almost start putting material behind it. You'd have to do something to get this kind of nice hackle around it. You'd have to add the hackle and the more material that's all cramped together, actually the less it's going to breathe. This rabbit really has nothing restricting it whatsoever. So now it's free to just kind of 
move and breathe and, and you got the profile just by reversing it. That's what I mean by breathing in the water. If you just keep packing material, <laughs> packing makes, material. Yeah. No, no, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just what's your preference on thread for tying these? Because you're getting question. into spinning the deer hair. Yeah. I like, uh, it's by Semperfly, it's called Nano Silk. It's their gel spun. It's kind of a unique gel spun. And, and actually it's a, a 12 uh, thread or 50 denier, which is really, really super thin and skinny. Normally if you were using just regular 12 uh, thread, it would only be for dry flies because it just snaps so easy oh, man. this stuff i mean i can just bend this hook right now i mean it's kind of actually if i didn't have nano silk i don't think i could tie neat flies anymore i've gotten so <laughs> used to it and it's just incredibly strong i mean i can even tie saltwater flies with it i'll usually go into a heavier thread just because you don't need it quite as um clean so actually this stuff is so strong and thin i have to be careful that i don't slice through all the deer hair with it and spinning deer hair you need strong threads so i i, I just sing the praises of the semperfly nano silk one of the complaints when you well that's backwards so that's that didn't do anything with gel spun thread is it's a little bit more slippery than a regular thread. Um, I started using it early on, just got lucky. A guy I was watching on YouTube was using it and his shop was selling it, so I tried it. And I, I just got used to it, um, so it's never really bothered me. But I guess going to a gel spun type thread like this, uh, you know, I'll either put a little wax on the thread or I'm just really trying to be conscious of really getting it nice and 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 tight sometimes you gotta do a couple extra wraps i suppose but i have no issue with it and it's the strongest thread for size on the market it's really unheard of that somebody would use a 12 odd or 50 denier thread to do steelhead and big salmon flies you know you just you couldn't but the beauty is it's just so uh thin you almost get zero thread build up which when you're starting out that's that's huge i mean everybody str i struggled too you know, you start out and you're tying hobo spades or even woolly buggers and you just see this huge amount of thread at the end because you, you can't control that. And that, that really just comes with time. You don't need nano silk to be a clean tire. I just think it's the best stuff on the market for sure. So it's a little pricey, but it's, uh, I think it's well worth it. So Okay, uh, next step, I'm just gonna add some flash. And the flash of I'm using, you can use whatever color. I don't know where I got this. I, I have so much material that it's, I don't even wanna show you guys. You would think something's wrong with my brain. This is kind of like a mix of red, black, and copper. I guess I really like olive and copper for Great Lakes steelhead. I, I think it's a color that, um, people should have in their box, but you can use silver, whatever you want to use. And so how I like to tie my flash in, this is kind of helpful. And I'll show you on the other side too. And I got about, I mean, you can do as much as you want. I don't know, six strands or so. I suppose it depends on the water and color. You can always cut flash out on the river, if you think it's too flashy, you just can't add it back in. Or I haven't figured out how to add it <laughs> back in yet. You could glue it. So I don't know. I don't think you have to have it overly flashy. I just think that go ahead and get enough strands in there. And if you're on the water and it's really clear and you think it's too obtrusive, just cut some out. So what I'll do, and, and you'll see it when I come back on the other side, I'll explain it while, while I'm doing it. And you can wait for me to tie as I almost kind of hold it at an angle somewhat like this. So it kind of tense up into the wing a little bit. And this is really just aesthetics or preference. And when I come back, 
I like to double it back like this. And for whatever reason, I saw a guy do this one time and it just works. I'll come behind it one time and then in front, I'm kind of holding it up like so. And for whatever reason, that just seems to hold it all in place. Let me trim it and you'll see. Now you'll see guys take their scissors and slide through. That never works for me. I just happen, I cut all the thread off. So I just really kind of take my time on this part. I'm, I'm not as cool as the professionals where they, I don't know, I'll see guys, they just slide through and it's all tapered out. And I've tried that enough times that I, I know better now, so. And the idea here, why, why cut it at different lengths, I guess that might be a good question is, is anytime you have a material, you know, all this flash is, is it's one kind of material, whatever that mylar tinsel is. So if you were to cut it all at the same length, you left it all at the same length, its tendency is gonna to be to wanna to stick together. Just like, you know, two materials of a kind in the water, grab and melt. If you just kind of stagger the length out, it no longer wants to stick together. So you kind of get more motion happening. You get more bang uh, for your buck, if that makes sense. So just having a few different lengths from shorter to uh, longer, it looks a little nicer in the fly, but it also will move a little bit more. And I just, you know, tin it up into the wings, so it kind of flows up like that. It's not hanging down too much off the side. And like I said, when I'm tying it in, I kind of hold it almost down at an angle like that, just enough thread wraps to lock it. And then when I pull it back, I'm holding it the same exact way. And like I said, for whatever reason, just holding it and doing one thread wrap behind it like that, all of a sudden just makes it stay a little bit nicer. I don't know why it does that, but I just seems to do it well. So I like that there. So I'll just wait for that. Does everybody have deer hair as well too? Yeah. Okay. If somebody doesn't have deer hair, let me know. And I can give you an alternative for finishing the fly as well. So that at the end of it, you do get a fly that you could fish. In all honesty, you could whip finish a thread here and you could go out and fish this fly and probably do um, just fine on it. That's um, kind of one thing in, in tying. I'll try to plug this in as, as when you're tying a fly, whether you're a beginner, intermediate expert, um, I like to be tying in such a way that at any time I could almost whip finish it off and it's ready to go. It looks good. It would be a good fly. That's how you know you're just kind of tying clean. Your materials all have a purpose. Now that's relative. There's some flies that like a clouser, you couldn't just stop, you know, halfway without the other wing you need it. But for the most part, as you're tying, if, if you get to a point where you're like, man, I could just whip finish it here, fly looks good, it'll fish good, that, that's a good sign. You're really tying clean and, you know, only putting the necessary materials in. So. Okay, deer hair, looks like most of us are ready. Yeah, don't <coughs> wait for me at any time because I'm just watching tonight. Okay, sure, no problem. So what I'll do, all right, so I like a deer head stacker. If you don't have one, that's okay. These stackers, I don't know why they do it, but they seem to make a much stronger deer head at the end. So what I'll do is I'll cut a patch off and I'm just using some natural uh, deer, some hunter gave me and buying deer hair for these kinds of flies I like deer belly hair if you're gonna buy a type of deer hair for spinning uh for whatever reason the deer belly hair I find spins the best it's a little bit coarser I, I guess you know I find it spins better than deer spinning hair as silly as that may sound so and the deer belly 
generally comes in white so they can dye it in real vibrant colors. You can get real hot oranges and stuff if that's your thing. So when you cut a patch off, um, I have a good amount here. You don't really want to overdo it. And when I, I'm going to take the under fur out of it and how I like to take under fur out is I'll just kind of pinch it halfway and just kind of slide my hands. There's not much under fur in deer, but getting that out also helps it spin a little bit nicer. And once I have that, what I do with a deer stacker is simply put it in with the tips down. You're always going to lose a few pieces trying to get it in. No big deal. You can just stack it. I've seen guys make their own out of like shotgun shells and stuff. Stack it a few times like that. And what you'll find when you pull it out is it kind of aligns all the uh, tips for the most part. I got one kind of hanging. And it just kind of strengthens it. And so what I'll do is kind of look at about how far I want that head to go. About there. And I'll trim off some of the ends so everything is just totally aligned here. So this is about kind of what I'm dealing with. The straight tips, the aligned back end. And I'll set this one right on top. Now, this is how I do the monker head. Now, this is a little bit different than some of the other muddler heads, and they all have their place. So what I'll do is just a couple, not too tight, not too loose, just a couple wraps. I'm not going to spin it quite yet. I'll just let the weight of the bobbin just kind of hold that deer in place and I'm gonna take the exact same amount with the same proportion, rotate my vise up and I'm gonna place that right there at the bottom and then I'm gonna spin it all. And that's how I try to get a wide head with a good amount of hair just in one tie in point. Just to, just to get that whole turbo cone as I said before. Everybody with me so far? I know this might be new, some of the deer hair, okay. And like I said, you can go online. Uh, there's different ways. I mean, we could have just spun that one and then you can work forward and keep adding other ones and kind of get more of a muddler minnow type head. Uh, best way to get good with deer hair is just gonna be buying a patch and keeping your fly really simple and playing around with spinning till you kind of figure out what you like. So once again, I'll just hold it halfway, pull that under fur out like that. Take it, put it in my stacker, tips down. Now, if this is hard for you, don't, don't feel bad. I, I was absolutely terrible at deer hair the first Oh, I don't know, probably 100 times I used it. And your fly does not have to come out totally perfect and pretty. It will catch fish. I mean, some of my first monkers I tied, um, actually a monker was the first uh, fish I caught on my own tide fly in Atlantic salmon, actually. So it kind of has a, a place in my heart. So, but that that fly was for it. I mean, it, it was, I wasn't even doing the nice reverse rabbit at that point and my head was just all kinds of messed up and it fished really well so make sure you fish your fly so once again I just set this same exact spot or excuse me 180 degrees on the other side same tie-in point I'm not working forward with my thread and you'll notice I'll do one two loose wraps and if all goes well that head should start to really spin for us. And I'll do just a few turns. I like to come up with tension too, not just forward. 
it kind of keeps things from moving. Here we go. So now I got this big blown out head. I think, I mean, did you guys see we're on that, since we're on bare hook, I don't know if you could see how nice the deer hair will just fly around for you and really collect and spin. I, I feel terrible because you did such a nice job of lining them all up. And then I just looked away at something else for just like a couple seconds. I look back, oh damn, he did it already. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> and I you know, can't see. Hey, it, and honestly, guys, we don't have to go through all the flies I planned. If you guys are like, you know what, we just want to do this one, we, we could do this one again. I'm totally open. Whatever helps you guys out. So now, like I said, the way I'm doing it in two spots is a way for me, you know, up top and underneath is a way for me to get kind of the right proportion for this head. I guess my recommendation to you would be maybe just practice the one patch and spinning that one, you know, instead of maybe trying the two. If you're getting familiar with, uh, or just starting to familiarize yourself with deer hair, I don't, I don't wanna say that what I'm doing is super advanced, but it might be a lot easier just to, to to do that very first part and just spin that right there. And if you want a little bit more, you can do the same thing again right in front of it. So I just wanted to show you how I like to do this. And if you like it, you know, maybe attempt it after messing around. I'll be honest, I wanted to get good at these heads. I literally used to just take tubes and hooks and all I would do is just sit and spin deer hair, you know, just do it like 10, 12 in a row. Just keep practicing with deer hair. I got OCD on it. I'm not, I'm not saying you need to do that. I just mean, uh, yeah, it, it just takes time and getting a, a feel for it. And, and all of a sudden, it's like something will click one day. You'll be tying with deer hair, and it'll just become so easy and natural for you. You'll just know. You'll feel it. You'll be like, nah, that patch isn't going to work. And it, it it's something you can't really ex explain all the way through. You just have to grab it, do it spin it enough. So now what I do, uh, one thing I don't like, if you see this on YouTube, I'm not a fan of this, where they will like whip finish into the deer hair to finish it. Uh, I don't like that because there's no way to know how tight or compressed that knot is. Instead, I like to just grab it with my thumb like this and just pull that head back and get some wraps right in front of it, like so. And I'll show you how I like to trim it. But I like to get my thread in front onto the hook. And it's okay if we grab some deer hair, it's not gonna do much. And you can see it already starts pushing back. And then to finish the fly, I'll just simply add a little glue with the brush onto my thread get that onto the hook, and then I'll just whip finish right onto that, right into the glue. Since you have super glue on the thread and you whip finished into it, you know, one whip finish will be enough. So that's how I secure it. The trimming it, this is totally, once again, a matter of us a personal preference and let me see here with this but I got that right in the way. I like curved razor scissors. You don't need these to get this head. This just makes life easier. Took me a while to figure out that these uh, were really nice. And the trick for trimming deer hair, let me say this right off the bat, don't go into it like full tilt because all it takes is like one wrong, you know, cut and you've like just like cut right through the whole thing and the head will never take shape. So I just kind of, with the curved, I like them because it's a lot harder to just like cut through the whole thing. I start by holding it at a real steep angle and I just turn it in my hand. And I really like to take my time. Some guys like razor blades, depending on the type of head that you want to tie for all kinds of brown trout streamers and stuff like that. 
Uh, I've done that before. That gives you more of a kind of a square flat head if that's what you like. Um, I kind of like trimming it like this. And so I'm just holding, you can see I'm at a real steep angle and essentially the shape that I want the head to take is kind of like a turbo cone with the ring. That's, that's what I'm going for here. And like I said, that's really more about aesthetics at that point and personal preference. You could probably, you could totally mess this head up and it would still fish really nice. So I've tied a lot of green machines or, or the Atlantic salmon bugs and everything with a lot of deer hair. How do you manage or, or how much do you focus on the hair underneath getting in the way of the hook? Ah, that's a good question. So yeah, on a pattern like this, uh, I'll show you if it's, you know, on a hook, not on a tube, obviously on a tube or something, you don't have to worry. I'll generally kind of take a few extra like cuts underneath on that deer hair just so it doesn't get in the way um, of the hook. That's a good point. Like flatten it out just a little bit more on the bottom maybe or you can kind of cheat a little bit and sneak into these guard hairs and just hit a few of them too. I've seen guys who just come straight across on the bottom as well and that kind of gives it helps that pattern to ride maybe a little so bit at what truth. point do you yeah so at what point do you figure you've got like there, there's obviously a balance point between the amount of hair that's there because you don't want to strip it all out right but what do you what do you consider appropriate for for amount underneath that yeah um I, I guess I just kind of look at that hook point and try to envision a fish's mouth. And so on this one, I'm gonna take a little bit more off of the bottom. When I Is that what you're asking? Like, how do you know when it's, it's good on the bottom and not gonna interfere with the hook or just in the head overall? Exactly. No, no, the bottom, the bottom, the, the top is, as far as I'm concerned, the top is aesthetic. That's personal yep. preference. You're going to make exactly. it look the way you want to. Yep. But there's a mechanic at the bottom where the, I, and I've seen it where the, the amount of hair you have on the bottom does interfere with the hook, uh, with the, the hook action. The one thing on the hook that we could do is kind of take a straight pair of scissors now and maybe get just a little bit more flat I suppose with it and generally with a hook pattern like this like I said I, I'm, I, I like tying these on weighted tubes quite a bit and then it really doesn't matter about the bottom because that tube hook is is out but what you're saying is a really good point so something like that is probably good for me you know the hair is soft enough yeah. You lose a little bit of the symmetry of, of the fly, but it's going to fish uh, a lot better. So basically, that's just a muddler head in front of a zonker. Uh, and, and I like tying them this way, using that rabbit as a hackle, because now we really don't need to add hackle. I mean, you could if you want. If you want to put guinea first just to get some more contrast in there, it's really totally up to yourself. But I find that... Um, these little flies in the spring when the steelhead are coming in, they just, you know, mimic those little bait fish and sculpting so well. Like I said, and they, they may not be the prettiest uh, fly, but they're really, really effective. I think you'd be surprised too how many bass or pike, I mean, pike eat anything. So I've had pike come up on top water, you know, kind of skating mufflers and stuff too. If they're in the mood, um, it's game on, but I find this to be a good Great Lakes steelhead fly. I like the weight on it as well. You don't always need that, but that kind of allows you to, if the water's clear, the river's low, you can go kind of stealthy and lengthen out your leader, even run a full float if you want, and, and the fly itself will kind of break the depth, especially we got rabbit, we got deer hair, 
having a little bit of weight just to break that surface tension so it doesn't want to like float on top like this for a while really helps. So that just kind of cracks the surface, the weight that you put on and allows it to kind of ride right under the water. So yeah, that's just what I call just a, a just a basic monker on a hook and one of my favorite um, uh, steelhead flies. And actually a, a fun one to get into, even if you're new to tying, because really your material list there would be hook, bead, zonker, deer hair, flash, deer liking. And so that's a, a fun one. And you can make this as fancy as you want. As you can see here, you know, if you want to add pectoral fins with pheasant rump hackle, you can do that. You know, if you want, you just kind of tie them concave, totally up to yourself. But this is just a good all around uh, starting point to tie them. I think it imitates the scope and just fine. So everybody's still with me. I'm not boring you to death, am I? No, it's so, you're doing good. Good, good. You never know, you know, you, you always wonder. I'm like, ah, I hope they like it. So <laughs> but at least we're all fishing in the Great Lakes too. So there is some um, good overlap. I'll be honest with you. I've often wondered the guys out West. And like I said, I don't know their rivers. I mean, essentially each river system kind of over time develops a unique strain of a fish, you know, that are unique to that river that possibly like different things or different sizes of flies at, at different times. But in the Great Lakes area, Kevin Feenstra has got a great book and he fishes the M Muskegon area quite a bit. And he's really dialed in flies for those Lake Michigan steelhead. And he's got a book out too. And he did a bunch of underwater scuba diving footage of what the sculpin looked like at different times of year. So it's totally interesting. But he found in the dead of winter, when the water clears up and those temps are in the 30s, you know, when you're dropping below that 40 degree, that and out west, you, they, when they do winter steelhead fishing, they're always tying these, seems like really big, gaudy, tight patterns, you know, intruders for their winter. Maybe that works out there. But what, what Kevin fishes, and quite successfully, for winter steelheading, temperatures are down in the 30 degrees, water starting to clear up. He says natural sculpins like this will outfish. All of a sudden, they, they, they just like flip a switch. And those big gaudy flashy things they like when the temps were like in the 40s and it was November, no longer will they move to it. They've gone right to like that natural bait fish in the, the river system again. So I've always wondered, I wonder if the guys out west like just threw some olive oily buggers in the winter instead of gaudy intruders if they've had more success. I'm not sure. So their, their river counts aren't the best. So, uh, okay, we'll go to Is any other questions. Do you use this one at all on like the still water? You're mostly fishing the, the river mouths, you said? Yeah, I will uh, take ones like this out um, in the summertime, kind of flats fishing still water for like bass or, or carp or pike and everything else. So, and it, it seems to work really good. So I like, I like the woolly bugger a lot for still water though too, so just because you can almost let a woolly bugger sit and soak out there uh, and fish seem to go for it. And this one seems, you need a little bit more motion either on the swing or kind of stripping it in like something. But yeah, I think it'd be a great, it's worked well for me on still water. So do you guys, any of you guys, have you ever targeted carp? Do you get carp where you're at for one? We or do, yes, we do. Um, yeah, I think there's a whole bunch of carp in the Ottawa River um over here we also have uh georgian bay uh on um okay and uh we have like flats out there that people can cast to and it's almost like fishing for bonefish dude i gotta tell you cart fishing on a fly rod is one of the most fun fishing they are really tricky and moody i mean i i or some days I feel like I'm a pro and then weeks I'm like, I, I don't know, I can't make them do anything. But like our Great Lakes carp are so fresh and 
clean and they're big and it, it's just fun to go out and cast to these fish in the summertime man so i yeah i think it's one of the most underrated um fly fishing uh fisheries or experiences you know and on the great lakes we're just blessed we get like um just huge schools of i mean these carp some of them are 30 35 pounds out there you know and they don't run as hard as the steelhead but like a big fresh you know 30 pound fish is a 30 pound fish <laughs> I, I tell you what they will pull you to your backing you know of course if that fish was the salmon or steelhead at the same size it'd be a lot harder but yeah you go out with your eight weight single hand or i mean I've, I've done it with the um spay rods that's fun too you just get a little bit more stripping or whatever but if you guys have never gone for carp i i would uh it may ruin you for like stream trout fishing in the summertime and it's just it's that much fun going for these carp you know and sometimes they're just you know you get to go out in your shorts and sandals and uh it's like middle of june july 75 degrees outside fahrenheit and um there's just all kinds of huge fish out there you know schools of them so it's a blast but i i recommend it if you guys haven't done it yet so and i find when they're in the on mood, rice lake. what's that i was gonna say on rice lake where we have a cottage i see the yeah. carp all the time like just flying out of the water i think they're spawning that's a good sign. If you see them jumping like that, I found they're weird. If they're cruising in pairs, like where you just see them constantly cruising, it's like they're following, it's almost impossible to make them bite. It's not impossible, but it's really hard. You see them schooled up and they're like jumping up out of the water and stuff. That's the time to cast them. And honestly, I've, I mean, if they're in the mood, um, I don't know how important fly patterns are or whatever, but I would not hesitate to throw a woolly bugger or, or something out there they will it's weird though because you won't feel them like tug right away you almost got to watch and when you see their gills flare you know at first if you're if you're kind of can't see them but they're out there you'll think he got snagged on a log and then all of a sudden they they take off funny fish fun fish to target so okay 